the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Welcome to this celebration of the Eucharist from St Michael's House in Warmer Green on the fifth Sunday of Lent, the beginning of Passiontide. You may have sight of the collect and readings for this Sunday. You might like to use this to pray with me and to follow the readings. If you don't have it, that's absolutely fine. You can still pray with me and listen to the readings as we go. You may be wondering why we are not in St Michael's Church, as was expected. It was given the change in advice from the government on Monday evening that the Church of England has instructed its clergy to set a good example and not to go into church buildings at the present time. Instead, we are being encouraged to live stream from our homes and to continue the tradition of celebrating the Eucharist. So over the next few weeks, you will see the transformation of dining room tables into home altars. Whilst we may not be physically present, we gather this morning as a dispersed community yet joined in our common faith in Jesus Christ, who in this sacrament is made manifest, not just by my hands, but by all of you who join with me in prayer and thanksgiving also. It is only with you, my brothers and sisters, that this is possible. And so let us hold together a moment of quiet. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let us then show our love for him by confessing our sins in penitence and faith. O oh God, you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let not the flood overwhelm me, nor the depths swallow me up. Let not the pit shut its mouth upon me. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Hear me, O Lord, as your loving kindness is good. Turn to me as your compassion is great. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness. And keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you, with the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We sit for our first two Bible readings. A reading from the prophet Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. 
Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the letter of St Paul to the Romans. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, through the body, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. A certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. 
Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews, who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? And he said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Church currently finds itself in the season of Lent, arguably the most important season of the Church's year. And today, the fifth Sunday of Lent, is the beginning of Passion Tide. It marks the beginning of a more sombre tone as we approach Holy Week and Easter. In many churches, should we have been allowed in them, you would see statues and icons veiled. Our journey in the wilderness takes on a new dimension during these final two weeks. We turn with Jesus to his passion, to his suffering and death for us. The covering up of these items of devotion, these works of art and objects of beauty, helps us to enter into the profoundly sorrowful experience for which we prepare ourselves. In a sense, it is a stretching in time of the even starker atmosphere we encounter on Good Friday, when the church is entirely stripped and all is plain, bare and hauntingly sparse. At the beginning of this season, I never thought that all worship in churches would be cancelled. Something, I'm told, has only, that has only happened once before. So the church finds itself in a literal wilderness, a semi-permanent state of sparseness. The public worship of God and gathering of Christians in our church buildings has ceased, albeit temporarily. 
that this wilderness we find ourselves in now is not just affecting the church, it is affecting everyone. People in all walks of life, people in different countries, people of all ages. The wilderness of today does not discriminate. But if we think of this season of Lent, this time of journeying with Jesus into the wilderness, this time of our churches being that little less colourful and the liturgy of the church being that little more sombre, we must also keep our hearts and minds fixed on what this season is preparing us for. Lent prepares us for a greater appreciation of Easter, just as Advent prepares us for a greater appreciation of Christmas. Both Easter and Christmas would not be as meaningful if we didn't have the austere preparatory seasons which precede them. On Friday, I was privileged to officiate at a funeral. And driving into the grounds of the crematorium, all around me were leaves just beginning to unfurl and a swarm of daffodils greeting me with a blanket of warming yellow. Reminders that the darkness of winter, the darkness of Lent, the darkness of grief, is soon to become something of the past, for there is something greater to look forward to. And the Gospel passage we've just heard tells of perhaps the most personal disaster of all, death. Lazarus, Jesus' friend, has died, and we're told of the reaction felt by the two sisters of Lazarus when Jesus arrives to console them. On the one hand, Martha runs out to greet Jesus before he reaches the house and appears to reprove him for not being with them earlier. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. On the other hand, Mary remained in the house with the mourners, only coming out to meet Jesus some distance away. When her sister calls her, but Mary too tells Jesus that her brother would still have been alive had he arrived sooner. But Lazarus is dead, dead and buried. Of that there is no doubt. The mourners confirm it. Jesus himself confirms it. Is that why Jesus delayed setting out to Bethsaida when he surprised his disciples by waiting two whole days before making the journey. But what is perhaps most significant in this story is about Jesus himself and the lead up to his own death and resurrection. Before raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus says to Martha in their conversation, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. It is this theme of raising Lazarus from death to a new life that helps to prepare us for the coming of Easter, that moment when Jesus himself has died a humiliating and agonising death, and then, after three days, returns to the world to confirm those words he spoke to Martha for us. When we believe in Christ, even though we die a physical death, we will be raised again. What follows this time in the wilderness of Lent is that great feast, the most important day in the church's year, Easter Day, the day of resurrection, the hope of the Christian faith. A day when we recall the disciples visiting Jesus' tomb in which his body lay, to find the stone rolled away and the body gone. In Matthew's Gospel we read of an angel appearing, telling the disciples he is not here, for he has been raised. The darkness of the world at this current time, and the darkness of our grief, may be overbearing. But as Christian people we come not without hope. We come as Easter people, always looking forward to the resurrection, setting our eyes on what is to come. As we enter the darkness of Passion Tide, 
the story of the raising of Lazarus hints at that future of the new dawn and the raising to new life promised to us all. Amen. affirm our faith now using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. We pray this morning for the peace of the whole world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all people. In this time of international uncertainty, we pray for governments and world leaders around the world who are dealing with the coronavirus outbreak. We pray for all health workers, for all who are working hard to ensure that we have the supplies that we need. We pray also for all those for whom this time is a lonely time, for all those who are isolated, all those who are scared. Asking for the Lord to enfold them in his loving arms. We pray for the response of our churches here in the Welling team. And we pray for St. Giles in Codicut, for St. Peter's Church in A at St. Peter. For St. Mary's Church in Welling. For St. Michael's here in Walmer Green. For All Saints Church in Datchwa. And for St. Peter's Church in Chewing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your church gathered throughout the world. We pray for this diocese of St. Albans. Praying for Alan, our bishop, that he may be built up in faith and in love. We pray too for the leaders of our sister churches and for all clergy and people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We 
We pray for Elizabeth, our Queen, and for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority. We pray that in this time of uncertainty, we might work with one another for the common good. We pray for our government, for Boris, our Prime Minister, for Jeremy, the leader of the opposition, and for all who strive to make society a better place. We pray for those parts of the world where people are ruled in fear and tyranny, praying that the light of Christ might dwell in those places of darkness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick in body, mind or spirit at this time. We pray for Bobby Wilson, and Roger Carden, and for all those known to us who are unwell at this time, for all those who are suffering from the coronavirus, for all those who help nurse them back to health. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who have gone before us in faith. We pray by name for Wendy Carbone, Sheila Edmondson, George Russell, and Norma Potter. We pray for all those who mourn, asking that you might give to them the confidence of your resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In a few moments of quiet, we bring before God our own prayers and petitions which have not been said, but are on our own hearts and minds this day. we pray we do so in the knowledge that we do not pray alone, but surrounded and sustained by the whole company of heaven. And so we join our prayers together with theirs as we say, Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we come now to the peace. Once we were far off, but now in union with Christ Jesus, we have been brought near through the shedding of Christ's blood, for he is our peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace be with you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. For your goodness we have this bread to offer, 
which earth has given and human hands have made, it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God for ever. are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God for ever. I said at the beginning of our Eucharist this morning, I'm not able to do this without you, and so I invite you to join with me in the prayer of the church. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For as the time of his passion and resurrection draws near, the whole world is called to acknowledge his hidden majesty. The power of the life-giving cross reveals the judgment that has come upon the world and the triumph of Christ crucified. He is the victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever, our advocate in heaven to bleed our cause, exalting us there to join with angels and archangels, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who, in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same way after supper he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. You are the Saviour of the world. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people, and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, 
so that we, in the company of Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, St. Alban and all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. body of Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have taught us that what we do for the least of our brothers and sisters, we do also for you. Give us the will to be the servant of others, as you were the servant of all, and gave up your life and died for us, but are alive and reign. 
now and for ever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. <clears throat> have a notice uh, to give, uh, which is a very bizarre thing to be doing uh, to a couple of cameras. As I'm sure you are aware, a curacy is for a limited time. And in this diocese of St Albans, it's for about three to three and a half years after ordination. And it will have been three years since I was ordained this coming July, and so my time as curate in this benefice is naturally drawing to an end. Today it uh, is with sadness, but also with great joy, that I tell you that I have been appointed priest in charge of Ampthill with Millbrook and Steppingley in Bedfordshire. The three parishes are of a similar context to those in the Wellin team. I will be remaining in the diocese and close to my family and friends, of course, many of whom are in St Albans. As I say, this is an exciting, uh, yet also a, a sad time, as I've enjoyed my curacy so much here. I've enjoyed meeting so many different and wonderful people across the parishes of the team throughout these past three years. But as I say, this is a natural progression. Of course, given current goings on, when I will be licensed and when Daniel and I will move is, of course, an unknown. I suspect it will be towards the end of this year. So you are stuck with me for a few months more yet. And now I invite you to bow your head for the blessing. Christ crucified, draw you to himself, to find in him a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sins forgiven, and the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the, the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.